So it's my really great privilege and honor to introduce to you Donald Palumbo, who is the chorus director of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk about how, uh, when I'm presented with the fact that I'm doing Meistersinger in the 14-15 season, how, uh, what the approach is to getting the piece onto the stage. Uh, of course, the first big problem is that I need 150 singers uh, instead of the 80 that I have in the regular chorus. So we actually do uh, auditions for extra choristers a full year ahead of the season in which the opera will be performed. So that means that the auditions for the, the extra chorus for Meistersinger were done back in, in uh, 2013 in, in the fall. Um, Meistersinger is certainly the largest chorus opera that we, we do at the Met. The, the next closest, I think, would be Boris, which is 110. So the jump from 110 to 150 is, is, is quite a, a, big, a big leap. The other thing that has to happen with casting Meistersinger for the chorus is you need to cast the Lehrbuben, which uh, in this production we use 10 women and 10 men. The men, quite easy, the, the part is written for tenors, so we, we hire ten tenors. The women is another, is a little bit dicey. Uh, the score says alt voices, uh, altos, mezzos, sopranos, but the tessitura of the part is so, uh, the, the range is so high uh, in some of the passages that if you engaged all mezzos, sopranos, you'd have a little bit of, of a problem with some of the pages. So you have, to, you have to do a mix of sopranos and altos. If you have good high mezzo-sopranos with, with a cutting voice, you can, you can let them sing some of the, the higher stuff. But, uh, so I, I always try to go for a mix of about maybe four sopranos and, and six, six altos. So you've got the Lehrbuben and you have this huge extra chorus. Now you take a look at the score and you see how everything plays out over the three acts. The beginning of act one starts with the chorale, that the, the overture leads into this chorale that is sung on stage. In this production, the chorus is in a diagonal facing one side of the stage, far upstage. And um, for this we use only the 80 regular choristers. And the reasons, I think, are twofold. First of all, I'm not sure we could get 150 people sitting in the church. As it is now, some of our choristers don't even have costumes on. They're standing behind the people that you actually see in the church. So we could never get 150 choristers on. The other, thing I, the other reason, I think, is just purely from a financial point of view. You're, you don't have to pay 150 people to come at 6 o'clock and stay around till... 11.10 or 11.15 in the evening. So we start Meistersinger with just the 80 regular choristers. In this production, I'm actually, as you're facing the, the stage, I'm actually at the far right corner in front of the chorus with a television monitor uh, conducting, conducting them since they're, they're looking my way. Now, Originally, when the production was done, the chorus master put on a costume uh, which had big puffy sleeves and um, only because people thought that as I would make my escape from the church upstage that maybe there might be some people in the highest balcony that could see over the set and could see me escaping, okay? Well, I think the past chorus masters have worn this costume, but I said I'm not wearing this costume. <laughs> um, I think with today's uh, uh, instant access to everything, uh, I think I would have been plastered all over the internet in this outfit. And I, I immediately said, if I have to do this, I will either sneak out in a black, uh, totally black turtleneck and pants, or I will just spend the entire first act sitting on stage and I'm not wearing this costume. So I actually sneak out without having to put the costume on. Um, then what happens? The, the congregation disappears, and the bulk of the chorus doesn't appear until the end of the second act. What happens is the Lehrbuben then take the stage, and in our production they, they build the set, basically. 
Um, they, they basically serve as, as very talented uh, stagehands, constructing everything that you see in, in, in the first act of Meistersinger. Um, the music is very conversational. It's much lighter than, than anything you'll hear in the third act, certainly different from the chorale. And they end up then having to be on stage through in the entire first act. Uh, you'll see them up climbing in the gallery and sitting watching the Meisters. And then they join in at the end of the first act. So one, one sort of misconception about the chorus in Meistersinger is that there's tons and tons of music to sing. It's really not the case. There's a lot of time that they're involved on stage. But if you actually compress all the chorus music in Meistersinger, you can actually run it in a rehearsal in maybe 15 minutes. It's kind of shocking that we're, we're in the theater for six hours and we're singing for 15 minutes. Um, uh, it is, as far as amount of music, it, it's, it, you can't compare it to something like Lohengrin, where, the, where, as you know, the men just never shut up in Lohengrin. It's constantly back and forth in the chorus. So Meistersinger, is short, compact, but so detailed and so intricate. That's what makes Meistersinger so interesting for the chorus. Um, okay, so now we're into Act Two. Again, the Lehrbuben start out Act Two. Uh, uh, uh they, they set the stage for the fact that now we're moving, preparing for the festival. They appear in the first five minutes of the act, and then they disappear till the end of the act. And then we end up an hour or so later at the end of Act Two in the famous Prügelszene, which is one of the most incredible pieces of music ever written. Um, I think if you look at a score of Meistersinger, you'll see there's one line after another of vocal parts to be executed. Basically, what happens is the chorus breaks down into Four groups plus some soloists. The women that are not Lehrbuben are, are not neighbors, Nachbarinnen, and they sing in four-part writing with very intricate patterns of 16th notes moving from part to part. And the way Wagner wrote it, it's extremely difficult to memorize, not for the music, but for the rests. And what has evolved over the years is a, a Bayreuth-generated way of rewriting the parts so that all the women basically are constantly singing. Instead of singing a phrase and having two bars rest and letting the second sopranos continue instead of the first say, they've written what we like to call a railroading system so that every voice keeps moving. So basically you're singing and you don't have to count empty bars. Sometimes rests are more difficult than actual notes. Notes, you have something to grab onto. You have a text to grab onto. Counting empty spaces is very difficult. So we have the women's group of neighbors who just keep singing. You have the Lehrbuben, who have their own music. You have a group of men, journeymen and, and, and uh, comrades, tenors and basses. Uh, basically two-part writing, but again, too many rests. And so you tend to have the tenors doubling the basses when possible, and, and the basses when it's not too high, singing some of the tenor lines. Of course you have, I believe it is nine Meistersinger solo, soloists who have their own lines to sing in all of this. You have Magdalena, who actually of course, Magdalena's cast mezzo-soprano, alto, contralto, whatever. She has a high C in this thing. Sure, it's a scream, but it is marked a high C. <laughs> and and Karen, Karen really nails it as a high C in the scene. And then you have a, a strange line that's listed as Meisters. And you've already got the solo Meisters, but there's one other line that's called Meisters, and they're the ones that sing the Cantus Firmus. Bum, ba, da, tum, ba, da, tum, bum, bum, ba. Count, count, count. Da, 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 tum, ba, da, bum, ba. Count, count, count. <laughs> so, and of course, all this is going on while the orchestra has, uh, I don't know, thousands of 16th notes to play. 
it lasts about three minutes. Again, I say, if you run this stuff, it's short. But it's, it's probably some of the hardest three minutes of writing ever, ever put down on any page. And I often think with pieces like this, what did this sound like back in 1868, when, when the whole level of choral performance was not at the high level that we have in today's world? I, I just can't imagine this piece being executed uh, without problems. The other thing is Bayreuth, because of the delays of the sound with the orchestra and the stage, this scene in Bayreuth is a real nightmare. You know, I, I'm sure you know, Parsifal was written to, to accommodate the acoustic in Bayreuth. It all works because everything blends together. But when you need ba -ba 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 that kind of precision, Meistersinger in Bayreuth is always the most difficult opera to prepare musically. Um, that's act two. Act three, by this point, the extra choristers have arrived in the theater. I believe their sign-in time is 10.30 or 10.45. Uh, and then we have the amazing scene uh, at, the end of, at the end of Act Three. The Lehrbuben still have their own individual lines to sing. The scene begins with the entrance of the guilds. And in the score, there are actually only three groups of guilds that have separate entrances. The first guild to enter would be the tailors. Uh, Schneider and Schneider, no, Schuster. Schuster, the, 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 shoe, the cobblers are first. Mm -hmm. The tailors are next, and then the bakers are next. If, if you create three separate groups of choristers and you start the opera with just Schneiders on stage, you're not gonna have enough sound to really cut through the orchestra. So what's done in all theaters is you have a group of townsmen that are preset on stage. They can be dressed as different guilds. I think at the Met we have a group of um, butchers, uh, we have a, butch uh, a group of coppersmiths, and there's one other I'm not gonna remember, it. Uh, uh, carpenters. So they have their own costumes and their own groupings, but they don't enter there on stage to help with the music. And then we keep the groups that actually enter, that can't sing the previous music, down to a bare minimum and augment with supers. So you still have the sense of guilds entering, but you can execute the music with, with, with power. Um, and once then everybody is on stage, then what happens in the scene is, of course, the Wachauf Chorale that happens. And then all of the interjections during the prize lead, all of the comments with Beck Messer, for example, when he, when he botches up the song. And, and the, the wonderful thing about this production, the way it's staged, we're all very close, we can all hear the words, we can all laugh at the appropriate spots, and it, you know, it's, this production, I'm sure, I, I think everybody will agree, is just one of the miracles of, of, of opera, as far as I'm concerned. And then, uh, then of course, the final uh, uh, saluting of, of Hans Sachs at the, at the end of the act. So that's basically what our job is in Meistersinger. Uh, again, you have a combination of a solid chorale, just like, like a Bach passion, you have the Lehrbuben with this conversational discussion. You have this incredible, fast uh, concertato in a way that's, that's 10 times more dif difficult than any Italian concertato at the end of an act, you know, Rossini end of act one, say. Can't hold a candle to, to Wagner, the end of act two of Meistersinger. Even though the, the idea is kind of the same, putting all these elements together and have it all just explode at the end of an act. And then the, the, the beautiful writing in the third act. Um, so we love to sing Meistersinger. It's a long evening in the theater. It's especially long evening at the Met if it's a Saturday evening performance and you've been in the theater for three and some hours for a matinee. So, uh, but again, we get chances, we get chances to relax in Meistersinger unlike some of the principal, principals who have to really get out there each act. Walter, who's on for so much of the time, singing very difficult music. Hans Sachs on stage a lot of the time. 
We get to come and go, and you know, it's great because we get to listen to great music, and, and you know, we have it piped through the dressing rooms at all times. So, for us, it's one of our, it's one of our favorite operas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, uh, which Wagner opera has the most... Oh, I think music? Lohengrin for the Lohengrin chorus. Is yeah. a clear winner. Yeah. That act two of Lohengrin. Yeah. Lohengrin, I think, has the most. Goethe Demerung has the loudest. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tannhäuser has a good chunk. Tannhäuser has a good chunk, you know, but a lot of it is based, uh, based in the, in the, the Pil Pilgrim's Chorus music, which is pretty straightforward. End of Act Two of Tannhäuser is also quite difficult for, from the ensemble point of view, mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite a long stretch of music. But Lohengrin, it's the back and forth with the men in both the first and second acts, mm -hmm. uh, less in the third act, but, mm -hmm. but Lohengrin is hard. Uh, Flying Dutchman is hard just because of the women's scene is usually musically very difficult to, 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 to execute. But, but from, a, from a difficulty point of view, certainly Act Two, Meistersinger, and all of the Lehrbuden music, just because you have to get brilliance and, and, and uniformity. Parsifal, well, Parsifal for the men is quite straightforward. For the women, for the flower maiden scene, for the chorus women, is extremely difficult. So people have this conception of Wagner chorally being so massive. Actually, if you analyze it, it really isn't across the board. Um, something like uh, Guillaume Tell, Rossini, for example, probably has more, probably has more chorus music in it, time-wise, than Meistersinger. Uh, but it's the quality that matters. It's not, not so much the time. Mm -hmm. How much, um, in, in your pairing, like preparing Meister Singer, um, how much rehearsal time do you have to do with the chorus to prepare to do this? Oh, I, I think maybe it's something like uh, 30 hours total. But see, the, the, the difficulty at the, is, at the Met is we can't say, we're going to devote two weeks and we're going to rehearse Meister Singer every day. We have so many different operas to rehearse and perform that Meistersinger rehearsals, or any opera, has to be spread out over the course of the entire year. We're, for example, we're doing a new production of Cavalleria and Pagliacci in uh, April, I think it opens. We've already done most of the music rehearsal in the summer because once we get near the time that Cav Pag starts staging, we have so much difficult repertoire that we're performing, we don't have enough time to rehearse it close to when it's going to be uh, staged. So Meistersinger, I think we, our first rehearsal was probably back in August at, in, at some point. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of have to, you have to gauge how much time to give early and then how many little spot checks do you have to do in the course of the time just before it goes to stage. The problem with Meistersinger again is the number of extra choristers. You, you, you can't call in a hundred and, well, it's not 150, it's more like 70 extra choristers for a one-hour brush-up rehearsal of Meistersinger. There are all sorts of rules. Two and a half hour minimum call. You know, we have, we have to honor these things. And if that's all they're singing is the third act of Meistersinger, you have to be very careful how to budget your time to make the best use of, of, of the time you have for the entire season's repertoire. Mm -hmm. you, you had, um, so far in the season, a couple of pieces with major oh. choral movements, like with the Verdi Macbeth. Verdi Macbeth. That has some really, how, how, how is the choral writing from the point of view of putting it on stage in the Verdi Macbeth? There could, the, I would say the mu amount of music in Verdi Macbeth is probably close to the, the amount of music in Meistersinger. The witches, again, have, have two huge scenes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the both finales of Act uh, Acts One and Two uh, have big core core writing. There's of course Patrio Pressa, the one co solo chorus number. But apart from that, there are uh, there are basses that come in in the first scene. There are there's a military chorus after Patrio Pressa. There's the battle scene. There's the final uh, final chorus. Um, Macbeth is one of the big chorus operas uh, that we do, as far as Verdi is concerned. This season was particularly heavy for the chorus in the fall. Uh, we started out with Macbeth, 
of course you throw in the Carmens and the Aidas, which are huge chorus operas, but we've done them so many times. But we also had this fall um, the Klinghoffer, which for the chorus was a huge project. Uh, I, I, it was, I, I, I really think it was, if we, were, we were really proud of, of taking part in that production. And I think for everyone that saw it, for a lot of people, the first 15 minutes, the, the two choruses at the beginning of the opera are probably the most beautiful pieces in the whole opera. I hate to sound, I hate to, you know, <laughs> say that, but the choral writing of, of the piece is just amazing. Um, and to be able to perform it accurately in a staged situation, that's the problem. It's one thing to sing that music sitting in a rehearsal hall or a recording studio, or a concert hall with an orchestra in front of you and the conductor relatively close. But to sing that very complicated, delicate writing of the, the first 15 minutes of the opera with the chorus, I mean, the women, some of the women in the very first scene were probably back where that table is. I mean, that's, that's the distance between the conductor and, and, and the sing, chorus singers at some point. You know, the thing about the chorus is we can't all come down to the footlights so that we have a good contact with the conductor. We're sort of always forced to stay back and we don't have the flexibility to individually move around to get in a good place to see or to hear. So once you have a piece like Klinghoffer, which is so delicate, so exposed, so transparent, the staging issues really, really are, are difficult to integrate into the execution of music that complicated. Um, the other thing we had this fall was Lady Macbeth and Metzensk, which was, I mean, it's difficult music to learn. Once you learn it, you sort of, it's not that hard to sing, but then you put it into a production that's so, so much fun and so <laughs> colorful and so kind of outrageous. That was actually, that was actually a lot of fun for the chorus to do. But again, it's a lot of work. So, so it's, been a, it's been a difficult, uh, heavy chorus uh, season so far at the Met. Um, mm -hmm. Right now we're working on uh, Yolanta, which has not been done, not a lot of chorus music. Tales of Hoffman comes back, the men have a lot to sing in that. Manon comes back, Balo comes back, Rake's Progress at the end of the year, Cav Pag. It's sort of, it's sort of endless. So when you get to this point in the season you ha and you have the, the undertaking of Meistersinger, there are, there are pluses and minuses. First of all, it is such a, a, a great release of energy at the end of the third act. But on the other side, it does come down past midnight. We've been working long, hard hours. So Meistersinger, I always like to think, should be a festival opera. Just like Les Troyens, I think, to do Les Troyens in repertoire is, is pretty difficult. Uh, to do Moses and Aaron, pieces like that where the chorus is just so difficult and so concentrated, it's difficult to do those operas in the context of a Met season with all the other pieces that we have to do. But uh, as I say, I have a great, a, a great group of people. The, the, the work ethic is just unreal. And um, we love what we do. So, uh, mm. you know, we somehow are able to pull it off. You pull it off extremely yeah, well, well, I would well, say. It's, it's you know, right? there. Yeah. I, have a, I have a question, uh, not about the Met Chorus, but about you. Um, what, what was your path to becoming a chorus director? How did, how, how did you evolve musically from where you started to becoming uh, involved in, in working with chorus? Um, I always loved singing in choruses. My training is not in music. I, I, uh, I went to Boston University and my major was chemistry. Uh, I never went to conservatory. I never went to music school. I, I s played the piano poorly, uh, but well enough to play for voice teachers in voice studios. And I, I lived in Boston and I, the first job I had was with a, a wonderful voice teacher who, who uh, let me play her, her voice lessons in the studio. 
you, you make connections. You say, hey, can you come down to Providence, Rhode Island? We're doing a production of Carmen. Can you maybe play the rehearsals? Oh, what about working with the chorus? It's an amateur group and they rehearse in somebody's basement once or twice a week, but uh, that's basically how it started. And uh, it was one step, step by step of working hard, but also meeting people that gave me other opportunities. Uh, my, my, the most important thing in my career was going to Dallas back in the, back in the 80s when the Dallas Opera was won by uh, Maestro Rochino, and we did four operas with the greatest voices in the world. And he had recruited the retired chorus master from La Scala, whose name was Roberto Benaglio, to come to Dallas and serve as chorus master. And I was his assistant for four years in Dallas. And that's, that's what did it. I, I always tell young people that want to become musicians, you have, to, you have to be willing to do almost anything. You have to get out there, you have to work. You can't just sit and study scores. If someone says, can you play, oh, we're doing a little program at my church this, this weekend and we want someone to, to play a couple of arias for, for a singer, will you do it? You have to say yes to everything at the beginning. You never know what opportunities are gonna present themselves. And, and that's, that's, how I, that's how I got here, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, nothing against music school, but it's, <laughs> it, it's not a guarantee. And it was not your path at all? No, no it wasn't. I, uh, I was always, uh, I was a mathematician in high school, sort of, and I loved science. But as soon as I got to university, I knew that this wasn't what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I just loved music so much. And, you know, it, it, it happened. I was, I was very lucky. Huh? Um, the difference between your role in an opera versus the, the conductor yep. of the whole thing. Yep. Could you talk about that, the difference between, let's say, your role in Meister Singer and Mr. Sure. Levine? Sure. Um, what I do is I, look at, I take the score, I prepare the chorus, and I, I, I try to get them to the point that they know the score well enough, just like with a solo singer, that when, when a different conductor is going to come in and work with the chorus, that they're flexible enough, knowing the score, to make adjustments for the conductor. I specifically don't set one specific tempo when I rehearse. I try to always take a different tempo so that they get used to different conductors. They get used to being flexible in a performance. Things are never, never the same in any two performances. And for a chorus, it's important to have that sense of ensemble uh, it, which is much more difficult, and I, I tell people this, and they, they sort of look at me funny sometimes, it's much more difficult for the chorus. 150 people have to decide what to do at any given moment. They have to decide in the same direction. They have to almost make the same decision. With a soloist, if you're slightly on one end of the beat, or if a 16th note isn't quite a 16th note, but it sort of veers toward a triplet, it's, it's not a problem. With, and even with an orchestra, even with an orchestra, there can be a little degree of smudging. With a chorus, because of the text and the numbers involved, if a 16th note isn't the same 16th note for all the members of the chorus, it sounds sloppy. And in a, perform in a live performance of opera, where there are so many components, lighting, movement, sight lines to the conductors, of course you can't achieve you know, the perfection you could in a recording studio, say, or in, in the rehearsal hall. But but the chorus has to be prepared to be flexible and to be accurate as an ensemble. And so I, don't, I, I try to prepare them so that they're, they're able to make changes according to the conductor. Now, of course, I always try to meet with the conductor if there are certain spots that are always dangerous or if there are different ways to interpret maybe a tempo change. It's certainly much easier if I can get to the conductor first and then bring the chorus that information. But again, sometimes in our rehearsal schedule, my final music rehearsal could very well be before the conductor actually arrives for the production. So uh, it, it's, always a, it's always a bit of a, of a guessing game when you, when you prepare a chorus. Um, some people say, isn't it frustrating because you do one thing and then they're asked to do something different? That's, that's, 
that's what's exciting about that's the whole live thing. Theater. You know, yeah. it's it's any great singer will tell you how much they enjoy working with with different conductors. It keeps it it keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. you, you spoke about that there are some moments in different operas that are particularly dangerous because of tempo change. Mm -hmm. some, could you give us an example of one or two moments that are uh, particularly dangerous? From uh, shall we do Shall we do a Meister singer, for example? You know, um, it, 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 in the Johannistag, Johannistag, it's a it's a six eight rhythm, and then all of a sudden. Ruf dich und wieder, singt allein eure dumm. All of a sudden you go from the 6-8 to a, a very rigid 2-4. And luckily the soloist gets to set it up before the chorus comes in. But there are some conductors that observe it very rigidly. He has it marked, I think, that eighth equals eighth. But there are some conductors that, that don't. They think it sounds too, uh, too uh, angular if you observe it exactly with that relationship. A spot like that is, is, is particularly dangerous. Dangerous. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of things in um, Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, for example, where transitions from, from you know, 5-4 into 2-4 and things like that, where you need the relationship between this bar to this bar, and not all conductors are going to do it the same way. Um, even things in Aida, for example, the triumphal scene in Aida, there are a couple of, a couple of moments where the textures change, where the priests enter, for example, in the judgments, in the triumphal scene. De la vittoria. Before that, the women are singing, Nembo gentil di fiori, you know, this kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, De la vi. Well, you know, is it the same pulse? Is it slightly faster? Is it, is it slightly broader sometimes? You, and those are the kinds of moments where a chorus has to be really on their toes and flexible. And that's going to depend on the conductor. That's going to be a, become, right? uh, depend, of course, on the conductor. Yeah. There are also times that we have a conductor change mid-run without a rehearsal with the chorus. I mean, there, there's, the, uh, there's the ultimate test of flexibility. You know, I can, I, can, I can talk to the conductor and say, look, this is what we've been doing. Are you going to do this? <laughs> uh, if they're smart, they usually say, okay. But, it, you know, but, no, but with my chorus, I can allow them to, to do things maybe that we haven't rehearsed. And, and as long as the conductor is, is, is going to be clear and I can warn the chorus that this is going to be a little bit different, stay on your toes, then, then we handle it. My first year... We did War and Peace, and Maestro Gergiev conducted three or four performances, and then Maestro Neseda came in and conducted the last two with no rehearsal. War and Peace, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about it. You know, the conductor gets to, if we do a change like that, the conductor will get some time to sit down with the principals in a room and go over things. Because we can't call the entire chorus, to a, a rehearsal just because of our scheduling, um, we're, forced to, we're forced to somehow find a solution. And that's, what, that's one of the things that the Met Chorus does better than anybody else. They're, 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 used, to, they're used to this. <laughs> Maybe I'm not used to this with my heart sometimes, but, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's what we do in a theater like the Met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very understandable. You need total flexibility. If you have change of conductors and, and from night to night, you know. Um, change, even change of singers. I mean, if we're taking cues off a soloist, you know, you've, you've, you've got to not assume that any kind of a lead in to your, to your number is, 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 is the way you rehearsed it. He's going to do something a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, I find it makes it exciting. It's live theater. Stuff happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, 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 learn, you learn to take every performance and analyze what happened, what was good, what could have been better, and then you take that into the next performance. And um, I, I, you, ha you have to be able to be flexible to adjust a as a performer a as you move through your career, I think. Mm -hmm. When you have a, um, a stage as big as the Met stage, and you talked about for example, in Klinghoffer, where the chorus was as far as 
back as the back of the room. Do you have any kind of aids on stage, mirrors or TV screens or anything? Yeah, there, there are TV screens on, in the proscenium and there are also some TV screens uh, on the balconies. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's not all, it sounds like, wow, that's a lot of coverage. You, you, there's no problems. But for example, uh, there are some productions where the lighting is so strong coming at you, you can't see that them. you can't see the televisions. I mean, we, we just had a, a situation in a rehearsal on Friday where if the, if the chorus is staged to be staring this way, in other words, not at the conductor, then they have to take advantage of those televisions that are there. Well, now the productions are being lit with such harsh, strong lighting, and they're usually coming from, from banks of lights that are on just adjacent to the televisions. Well, once they go full tilt, first of all, you can't look at them. Even if you could decipher it, after, after a few seconds, the lights are so harsh that you just can't keep staring at them. So uh, again, we, we, we made an accommodation. They took out one of the lights that was the lowest light so that we had one television that we had access to. So, I mean, that's, that's what the rehearsal process is all about. Uh, Meistersinger is difficult, uh, again, just because there are so many people on stage and so many of them are so deep into the stage. The other issue is that we, we have to have some sound speakers uh, on the sides of the stage for the people that are far away from the, the front and the orchestra pit. It, with Meistersinger, once everybody gets singing, you really can't hear the orchestra. Uh, so we try to get some sound to help the people that are far upstage. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you can say, what happened before all of this? Well, the theaters were a little smaller. Uh, I would assume the standards weren't quite as, as rigid. I mean, when I started out, when I did Madame Butterflies the first time, the entrance of Butterfly, which is a notoriously difficult spot in opera, I looked through the hole in the curtain, like they say is what used to happen. They used, they used to cut out a, a hole in a piece of scenery and you used to look at the conductor through that hole. <laughs> now, you know, now we have televisions. I mean, we're <laughs> when the chorus is on stage, and what, how well do you hear the orchestra? How well? uh, um, it depends on the opera. It depends on where you are on stage. Uh, it depends on um, whether, it depends, it's kind of a question of what the writing is like. If it's just a pizzicato accompaniment to something, you basically hear nothing. Um, of course, if you've got Meistersinger full tilt with the orchestra, that you hear a lot of. Aida, you hear a lot of orchestra. Klinghoffer, the beginning of Klinghoffer, zero, nothing. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing is you can't crank up the speakers that are feeding the stage too high, or you actually can hear it in the house, you have, there's always the danger of feedback. There, it, it's, it's, it's always a, a question of balancing the level of sound. Um, and sometimes, believe it or not, you don't want to hear the orchestra. Sometimes when it's so complicated, if you listen, you're going to be reacting to what you hear. Sometimes you have to just watch and trust. If you just follow this, it's going to work. That's another aspect of my job, telling the course how to how to adapt to what they see and what they hear in every individual situation. Well, let me say, first of all, that it was great having you here today and hearing about the complexities of what it's like um, yeah, doing the choral music that's involved in all operas. You know, it's very fascinating. And, and I want everyone is going to react to this, you, and you did it last night when we met, you give all the credit to the chorus, but you have been fabulous as a chorus director, and I think we should acknowledge that oh, to you. Um, I, I want to thank you, because you are the people that's, that, that are keeping opera relevant Really, no, it, this, is, this is heartfelt from everybody that, that works, works at the Met. It's our audiences and groups like, like this that, 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 that keep us going. So my, my thanks to you. All right. No, thank you. And, um,
I hope you'll come back and visit us another time. Oh, my pleasure. Great. Great.